we're going to talk about operations. And um, having had our first uh, mentor sessions yesterday and done the group allocation, some of you, about 1 20th of you in the room, are going to be the operations engineers. But this should be kind of much more widely applicable to everyone in the group because understanding how the operations feeds into your design and then how your design may affect the operations, the operational plan, is going to be really important. Okay? So this isn't just relevant to the ops person. This is going to be relevant to every single one of you in your groups and hopefully really, really relevant as you go forward anyway into a career in engineering because you have to consider how you're going to use your system and what it's going to do before you can really design it properly. Okay, so uh, this is the third of your six formal lectures within this unit. Okay, and we'll move on to systems models, which I'll take again next week, engineering decision-making methods with Peter Hollingsworth, and then mission analysis with Kira. And a little bit of an introduction here, just this is a simple CONOPS diagram. And you may have seen some of these in the past. Often you'll see them on things like infographics, maybe in the news, maybe in a newspaper, those kind of things. But that's one really, really simple example of a graphical format for CONOPS. Okay, I'm going to start with a couple of definitions here. And this is where it's going to get a little bit confusing to begin with. And then hopefully we'll come, like, come out of the top of it with a little bit more of an understanding of what I mean when I'm going to talk about con ops, so concept of operations, and ops con, which is operational concept. Okay. So this is a definition from INCOSI, which are the International Committee on Systems Engineering, or Council on Systems Engineering. And they define a concept of operations as a document. Okay, so in this case, they said document. Not picture, not video. They said document. That describes an organization's assumptions or intent in regard to an overall operations or series of operations. So you can think of this as a few things that maybe are coupled together. Of the business when using the system to be developed existing systems and possible future systems. So there's some type of timeliness involved in it here. And in comparison, they talk about an OpsCon or an operational concept as a user-oriented document that describes system characteristics of the to-be-delivered system from the user's viewpoint. Okay, so now we're getting a very much more user-focused rather than organizational or business-focused uh, definition here. And this document is used to communicate overall quantitative and qualitative system characteristics to the acquirer, user, supplier, and other organizational elements. So this is INCOSI's definition. Okay, so this is kind of spanning across the whole systems engineering community. If we use another well-known uh, kind of systems engineering organization, we can look at NASA. This is maybe going to be a little bit more focused on aerospace and space systems. So a concept of operations, by their definition, is developed early in your system design. Pre-phase A, as they call it. ESA have different definitions for some of these phases. And it's developed by the technical team, describing the overall high-level concept of how the system will be used to meet stakeholder expectations. Okay, so uh, stakeholder here could be users, it could be regulators, it could be funders, it could be investors. Think about all of those different types of stakeholders that you might have in your system. And they state usually in a time sequence manner. Okay, so we'll look at a few different um, examples in a little while, but one of the common themes is this kind of time sequencing. Commonality, it describes systems from an operational perspective and helps facilitate an understanding of the system goals. Okay, so what is your system going to do? Operational concept, on the other hand, they describe as how the flight system 
and the ground system are going to be used together to ensure that the concept of operations is reasonable. And they talk about mission data of interest is captured, returned to Earth, processed, made available to users, and archived, and developed by the operational team. Okay, so you'll notice that this second definition is a little bit more system specific. Pretty natural considering that it's NASA, but they talk about flight systems, ground systems, types of data, returning information to Earth. Okay, so it's a little bit more of a, a kind of a closed scope definition here. Okay. I've said a lot of words there, and they've overlapped a lot. It is confusing, okay? So concept of operations and operational concepts are confusing. I've given a bit of a timeline of where some of the definitions in the industry arose from, and then how they were maybe changed over time because people did not agree with it. Okay, so we've got people like the IEEE and the AIAA and ISO standards and INCOSI and all of these people have been trying to kind of align their different terminology together so that it's more understandable across the industry so that you have commonality and compatibility so that when one stakeholder says, I want a concept of operations, the actual people who are going to produce that have a very common definition to work from rather than misunderstanding what's required. Okay? In effect, this goes down to some of that requirements definition that we talked about before. If contractually you've been asked to produce a concept of operations but it's not been described, which of all of these standards should you adopt? If that hasn't been written down at the start of the project, it could be a really big point of contention. So generally, this is what some of these big international bodies have been working towards over time. But in general, we can look at con ops as the higher level view, communicating a vision and something towards a solution. And the operational concept takes that and provides more specificity and more detail based on that con ops. Okay? Both of them tell a story, and that might be in a time sequence manner, it might be in a spatial sense, so from a vehicle moving from A to B, for example. Um, you can communicate different scenarios, or maybe it's just one scenario for your mission using this ConOps, and then it will help you develop the use cases for your system or your vehicle, and then help you to define a feasible approach so that you can make sure that your system meets the requirements and then the user requirements and then the user needs, okay? So all of this should be somewhat traceable through your ConOps. If you look at your ConOps and you can't see that you're meeting what your user wants, then you need to reconsider that, first of all, that ConOps, but also anything that's derived from that ConOps because it, it won't flow through. Okay. So the key thing here is that the ConOps describes what the system will do and hopefully why. Okay, that should be kind of implicit within that definition, but definitely needs to describe what the system is going to do. Um, as we'll come on to in a few of these examples, it's often supported by graphics. It's a really nice way to show these things at a high level and make sure people understand it. it makes it really easy to communicate uh, these type of ideas. It provides a vision or a picture of the overall operations of your system. You can use it to validate your overall system architecture and some of your technical requirements at that high level. It should be concise. And if you look up concept of operations in the literature, sometimes these documents are not concise. They are tens and tens and tens of pages long and if you're asking someone to understand what your system is going to do and they have to read 100 pages of documentation, do you think they'll have actually understood it? Probably not. So ideally it should be a, a concise expression. Must be done early and that's why in this unit and in your design brief we want to see 
early on in this semester an expression of your concept of operations. You can refine it over the period of the semester, but defining this conops early will help you to define some of your requirements, will help you to drill down into some of the detail of your early design. Should consider various different parts of the overall system use. So I said integration, test, launch, actual mission ops, and then through to disposal as well. And then you might have dynamic elements as well. So transitions and interactions and interfaces with different types of environment. So you could express that as well through your conops. Okay, given a couple of different examples that are maybe a little bit more relatable to exactly what you're going to be doing in conceptual design for a spacecraft or a satellite. So in the early, very early kind of conceptual development, you're going to be looking at high-level system trades and decisions. Okay, so it could be something like, are you going to use a primary or a secondary launch opportunity? Are you going to be hard-mounted as a primary payload in your vehicle, or are you going to be a secondary payload that doesn't have any choice on exactly when you're going to launch? You might not have a choice on exactly where you're going to go, and you might not have as much control on things like your interfaces with the launch vehicle, the ability to charge, the ability to change anything, but, on the other hand, you might get a softer vibrational environment. So, for example, if you launch with, um, into a, in a P-pod, or you launch with someone like Nanorax, often those environments might be a little bit more friendly than if you're hard-mounted onto a launch vehicle directly. There might also be other constraints, like whether you can have deployable systems, whether you can have propulsion systems on board. For example, lots of secondary payloads are heavily constrained in terms of pressurized systems. So if you want propellant, you might not be able to use a secondary launch opportunity, or it might drive some very, very critical qualification elements of your design. And of course, you might be constrained in a different way than just the launcher in terms of mass and volume. Right? You might have to fit in a certain envelope for your deployer that might not be there if you use a different launch vehicle. Similarly, with communications architecture. Three high-level options might be you have a single ground station which you, as the operator, would uh, build and use. Okay? You might get three passes a day. You could have multiple ground stations in different locations, and you might get more passes a day. But you still have to operate those. They are part of your ground segment infrastructure and you have to consider exactly how you're going to use them. But you have more control over it. Or you could look at things like ground segment or ground stations as a service, where you're essentially outsourcing the management, the establishment of ground stations to another company, and then you have some type of service level agreement on how many passes per day your system has. Maybe there's a volume of data that you can downlink, bandwidth, but you don't necessarily have exact control over the scheduling. That might only be provided two, three days in advance by that system provider. Okay? Each of those, or each of those um, uh, alternatives will then affect things on the space segment side. What is the timeliness of your communications? Is it on a regular basis? How will you do your command and control over the long term depending on whether you have very regular ground station connections or maybe it's a little bit more ad hoc depending on service availability. You can think about autonomy on board your spacecraft versus always having to directly command and control things. So do you want to um, have a number of um, kind of processes on board that happen automatically? Or do you want to always be telling the satellite exactly what you want it to do? And if it can't do it, then to fall back into a mode where it just waits for the next instruction. And then similarly, you can look at things like onboard or what's now often called edge processing capability for your data handling. 
versus ground-based processing. Okay? You'll shift a lot more requirement onto your space segment, requiring additional processing power if you do edge-based processing, but you might reduce your uh, downlink budget considerably. That will also then feed into your ground segment design. Okay, so you can see how trying to define this overall concept of operations starts to highlight some of these really, really key system traits, and therefore the design of your system as a whole. Okay, so you need to start considering these as early as possible. Okay. I'm going to play the start of a short, well, the start of a very long video. And then I'm going to cut it off because you guys can go and watch this later. It's a fantastic video that basically shows the lifetime of the Rosetta and Philae mission. And in a second, after maybe 30 seconds of this, just as an introduction, Ian's going to come and talk about Rosetta and Philae, and Philae more specifically as a bit of an example of ConOps and operational concepts. Okay. Do I have sound? Once upon a time, a spacecraft named Rosetta was launched into the night sky. A long, long journey lay ahead of her to uncover the mysteries of our solar system. Rosetta carried a little passenger, the lander, Philae. It had taken many, many years to dream up this mission. And now, on the 2nd of March, 2004, Rosetta was on her way to the far-off comet 67P Cholumov Gerasimenko. The adventure of Rosetta and Philae was inspired by stories they heard from Grandfather Giotto. Long, long ago, men and women on Earth gazed in wonder at comets that appeared in the sky. What were these mysterious objects? Some thought they might be caused by Earth breathing into the sky. So, that video has loads and loads of little elements of ConOps in it. Uh, it's very kind of wordy, it's very narrative, but it's a brilliant, brilliant video, and there's lots and lots of inspiration that you can take from it. But then we're going to move on to the slightly more technical stuff here. So hopefully you can hear me, mic working. Um, that video was really emotional because I remember following it and all the humanization they did of Rosetta and Philae even got to the point where there was a Twitter account, and when the mission was over, the last tweet was, it's getting dark now and cold, I'm going to sleep, and it was like a small child died. So it was really emotional. The way they did it was fantastic. But the actual mission itself then, this is a concept of operations for the Rosetta mission as a whole. Rosetta being the orbiter that was due to go to the comet, to the Russian name comet that I can never pronounce, so I'll call it 67P. And it was a 12-year mission, so launched in 2004. It says there it had a number of flybys, two of the Earth and one of Mars, in order to go get the correct velocity and go in the correct direction. Then it threw, flew through the asteroid belts, observed two asteroids, and then had a period of hibernation where it went out into deep space and then came back in in the same orbital trajectory as Comet 67P over here on the right. And then once it had engaged and got into orbit of it, a small part of its mission was the lander mission, which primarily lasted about three days. And then the orbiter would have continued on observing the comet and getting lots of good signs out of it. So that is a really large um, concept of operations. So... Every single part of that could be broken down and analysed in huge detail. You can think about the launch of the two separate spacecraft and how they're supported. You can think about how they then go into the first uh, interplanetary trajectory and what status they'd be. You can think about the first and second flyby of Earth and whether you'd activate any instruments and use the opportunity to test those instruments on Earth in a close area where you've got lower link budgets for communication. You could use all that kind of analysis. If you're flying somewhere near Mars, you may as well take a picture and do some analysis. Why wouldn't you? So hopefully by the time you get to the two asteroids, you've tested everything and you know how your system works, and you know your correct modes, and you've done all the analysis, and then you can understand how you would do the flybys. 
You then go into the hibernation. There's loads of considerations there. You've got to shut your spacecraft down. You've got to make sure it's in a correct and safe mode and how long it's going to be in that mode and what piece of equipment have to still be working to maintain it. There'll still have to be some heaters as it's going further away. It's getting colder. It's getting less sunlight. Um, and then how it's going to wake up and how it's going to do the manoeuvres and go into the um, orbit of the comet. So lots and lots, of literally an endless list of questions you could ask that would influence your system design, your mission design, how it works. So that's very complicated and probably a bit more than we'll be able to do today. So I'm going to focus just on the lander and on that part, and that's complicated in itself. And we're going to try and look at what the concept of operations is, the big picture, what they wanted to do, and then we're going to try and analyse that and come up with at least some idea of what the operational concept was going to be, how it was going to do it. And we'll look at how they planned to do it, and then what actually happened and how the planning helped them react to the real operational situation. So there we go, the Philae landing, 12th of November 14 was when it was due to land, and effectively it was a three-day mission. And this is the lander itself, Philae, partly built in the UK, European Space Agency mission, about 100 kilograms with 10 scientific instruments on board, and all the scientific instruments together come to just under 27 kilograms, so about a quarter of the overall mass. So three quarters of the mass of the mission was just to sustain this payload instrument, so it's an idea of the difference in the scale there. Um, and these 10 instruments each had different roles designed by different teams with different priorities to do an all-round analysis of the comet. So looking at the comet itself, looking at the environment, looking at the magnetic environment. And they had a concept of ops just for the lander itself. So this is the diagram, the small scale diagram, or the large scale diagram of the small part of the big operation, just for the lander. And you could break it down into a series of phases. And again, it's time bound, so it's in an order. It's always good to think logically in time, what happens, then what happens next, and what happens after that. And effectively, it comes down to seven different mission phases. The separation from the lander. In fact, I've completely ignored everything before that. What happens to the lander in launch? How does it connect to the orbiter? How does it survive in the entire orbit? Does it get power from it? How does it survive the shutdown? How is it woke up? How is it ready to work? So there's a million questions before the separation. Let's start at the separation. So it has to leave the orbiter, has to leave it in the right place, has to leave it pointed in the right direction. We've got to think about how we would do that and how that information would happen and what Rosetta itself has to do to be able to allow that to happen. It has to move to the right place, it has to image the, the comet itself to see where it's going to go. And then you go through the stages. The descent, it was about 20 kilometres away, it was going to be released. And then how does it get from the spacecraft down to the comet's surface? There is gravity, it's a comet, but it does have mass, but it's not huge gravity, so how it's going to do that. The landing itself then, it's going to have some speed, it's going to have some uh, momentum, it's going to get to the surface, is it going to stay there, how is it going to land, how are you going to control that landing. Then commissioning, making sure it still works, it's in the right place, you know what's happening. And then there's two critical operations phases. The first and primary, primary operations phase was solely to get as much as you can do, uh, done as you can within about three days. So we'll talk about it in a minute, but they had an onboard battery that lasted around three days that was going to last the descent phase and the primary mission phase. So although the solar panels on it, it wasn't using them at that point, they were to charge a secondary battery. And in that first three days, the primary mission, it was all about getting as much science as they could. And then, all being well, if it was a successful, over time, the solar panels would receive enough power to trickle charge a battery and there'd be less power available but it could do continued operations over a course of months between November up until what they expected would be the end of the mission which would be sometime in March and that's because it would have got too hot on the surface because it get closer and closer to the sun. So there's two mission phases each with priorities and then when it's finished the close down would effectively be at that point when it's too close. So we've already started to think about what it needs to do, how it's got to go into the right direction, how it's got to get towards the surface, how it's going to stick. And there's a video here that's going to go through, and again, this is a concept of operations video of everything from the detachment from the orbiter all the way down to the end of the first operational phase of the mission when it's done the science, so when the batteries are close to dying. And as it goes through, I'm going to talk about some of the things you will think about in the operational concept, the how you do things, that come straight from the concept of ops. And you'll be able to think of loads more that I don't mention, and as it goes through... And I'm going to just raise a couple of questions and we'll speak about it after on why things are like they are and why they've been made these decisions. So there we go. Here's the orbiter. There's Philae on the side. 
and it detaches. So this is the point where it already knows where they want it to land, so they're released at the optimum point, it's separated, and it's sent in the right direction. It deploys the legs, but it's also going towards the comet, so there's thrusters, to put it that way, and you don't want it to spin, you want it to be in the right direction. So it has a reaction wheel on board, which keeps it any, um, any torques and keeps it pointing where it wants. Then it gets to the surface. There's foot screws that start drilling because it'll hit the surface at some speed. And then the thruster on the top will keep it in place. And at this point, the momentum wheels stop spinning as well. They discard the momentum to the surface as soon as there's a contact. Uh, you might have seen the harpoons fire, which grab it on to stop it bouncing off. And then the drills go in. So hopefully, then three devices, the foot screws, the thrusters, and the drills, keep Philae on the surface. Then they commission it, they're ready to start doing science. And the first experiment they do is just take a panoramic picture. And I just want you to think about why a panoramic picture would be first and who that would be useful to, why it would be useful to them. So they're doing the picture, and that's finished. Any second now. And then the second they decided to do, the second activity, they take another picture directly underneath the orbiter. So nothing's moved, they've just taken two pictures is the first thing they'll do. Once the, uh, the second picture's been taken, the whole spacecraft should start moving. There we go, so it starts to rotate. And in a moment, a drill will come out the bottom. So it rotates, and the drill is looking at where the position of the second picture it was. So they've looked at where they're going to drill, they've seen it before. And then they move the drill out and they start drilling. That starts doing the science on board, and every single one of these activities takes time, takes power. They need to know how much power it does. They need to know um, any pressures or any issues there might be. Comets might outgas, so is there going to, have, going to be any issues with the spacecraft? And then the whole spacecraft lifts up, so there's a mechanical design there to be able to lift the spacecraft. And that's so they can extend the probe and it doesn't impact in the comet's surface. Once it's extended, they drop it in and they push the probe in. Again, this takes power, this takes time. And the probe starts doing experiments, and there's data being generated in all these. Where's the data going? More science happens, and now we've got multiple probes, and they do an electric signal between them all, and they test the composition of the ground. And then they do the last few experiments, um, measuring the gaseous environment, and then I think they do radiation and acoustics. So a series of experiments, and that would all happen over a three-day period just on the primary battery. And eventually, that's finished, they've done it all. All the way through that, they've had to think about what's happening, how much power it needs, what the priority is, which one they do first, which one they do second. So to go back to the very start then, I said the panorama. There are a number of reasons why they did a panoramic picture first on landing. Does anybody think of why they would do it and for who? Really useful, so there's an operational reason. The uncertainty of landing, this has got the orbiter that releases it, but it's going to do a transit down. The comet's moving, the comet's rotating on a 12 and a half hour orbit. So they'll have different optional landing sites, and it's not exact, it doesn't land exactly on top of a penny. So they're going to have to know exactly where they are to look around, so there's a, uh, um, an operational, technical reason about why they want to get the picture first and know where they are. Any other ideas? Yep, so if they get the picture first, it could guide on whether they do the next things in the order they'd originally planned and guide it. So again, it's another operational reason. It allows scheduling and it allows them to change and react dynamically. So that was the first they do. Any more ideas? I've got at least two more. Media. Media. I'm so glad you sped, said that. So probably, madly enough, the most important part of any pretty picture from a mission is the media and the PR. All these missions are funded by states, ESA, NASA, um, and by countries. There's politicians involved, the public pay tax for it, and they want to have the pretty pictures. And if that mission landed and did all amazing science but didn't have a picture, everybody goes, so what? But if it landed and took a pretty picture and none of the science worked, everybody would go, oh, that's amazing and there's more funding. There was actually a recent mission called, mission called Juno that's on its way to Jupiter now that for science reasons didn't need a camera. So they didn't put one on there because why would you put something on that you don't need? And the first thing the politician did when he got a brief was, oh, when do we get the pictures? And they went, ah, best put a camera on it. So it's actually PR is a really good reason for political engagement. And to move on, um, 
the last one was for scientific reasons, so you can see the area, you get an image, you can start analysing and see what the rocks are like. So there's loads of different reasons why that's first. So taking the picture became the first choice. We've done lots of experiments along the way. It's generated loads of data. At this point, where's the data? Probably on the spacecraft, on the lander itself. So we need to get that back to Earth. So there's a whole path of getting that back to Earth. So you need to understand how often you see, see the orbiter. The orbiter is in a six-hour orbit around the rotating asteroid. So it's only going to go into, uh, into a line of sight irregularly as it goes around uh, the orbit. So you've only got a small window. Where is the orbiter? Well, it's only about 20 kilometres away when it's in line of sight. But it's probably in different directions, and you don't want to complicate it, so you have an omnidirectional antenna that goes at quite a low power. But it needs to have a relatively high data rate, because you're getting lots of good data, and you want to get it back to the orbiter as quick as it can as it comes across. So that affects your communications design on your lander and how it goes. When it's at the orbiter, it's then got to get back to Earth. So there's an interface there with the Rosetta orbiter in that design, and how much data it can store, how it receives the data, and then how it transmits it back to Earth. When it's going back to Earth, it's got to be able to be received. So there's the Deep Space Network, a series of different ground stations, but they'll be dealing with lots of missions. You know, we've got loads on Mars, we've got missions all over the solar system. So you've got to prioritise when the data's coming in. So all these decisions of the data influence the design and the timing and the order of how you physically do it. And that's the operational concept that needs to be thought of. So that was the plan. And then once this was finished, like I said, the, uh, the lander would receive sunlight because it sat on a flat, boulderless plane, was the landing site. Um, it received sunlight as it rotates, as the comet rotates, it had slowly charged the batteries, and then over a period of about four months, it would do secondary science and keep on going. But the orbiter would not be primary then, the orbiter would not be focused on it, it would be going off doing its own thing, so you then wouldn't be able to transfer information over every orbit. So there's loads of different phases of how it goes. What we're going to talk about now is what really happened. So there is Comet 67P. Um, that's really false image and really enhanced because it's as black as coal and quite edge of the solar system. So it really doesn't look like that if you looked at it with your own eyes. And that was generally the area where they planned to land. And you can see, certainly in this picture, it looks relatively smooth and, fe and featureless. It has a clear line of sight to the sky where the orbiter would be. And this is... Oh, I'm a little gifted at work if you did go down, but... This is the Philae lander. If you click on one, it might. No, too far, too far. There we go. This is the Philae lander, and this is being imaged from Rosetta as it goes. And you can see it's deployed the legs, so that worked. That was a good start. The reaction wheel started, so it stopped it spinning, so they planned that well. It made sure it was facing the right orientation. What didn't happen is the thruster, so there was a blockage in the thruster firing. So that meant it was actually slower going down to the, uh, the comet because the gravity effect, uh, it was only under gravitational power, gravitational drag, so it took longer, which used more battery power, which reduced the time on the surface. And there was then a question about what was going to happen when it got to the surface because the only things that were going to connect it to the ground were the harpoons and the drills, on, the spikes on the bottom of the legs. So it reduced the capability of it in, uh, landing successfully. So it was a concern... And then when it got to the surface, you can see in the pictures, the three pictures at the top, the touchdown point, it did land. And the first thing it did when it landed is turn off its reaction wheel like it was supposed to. But because the harpoon didn't fire and they had no thrusters, it was relying solely on the drills, which wasn't enough to keep it on the ground. So it bounced. But the reaction wheel had been turned off. So now it spun when it bounced as well. So a catalogue of failures meant it was now in a serious problem. And it bounced about a kilometre high and was actually quite close to the escape velocity of the comet. So it nearly bounced off back into space. But it didn't. Over a course of a couple of hours, it came back down, hit the ground and bounced again. And it went back up in the air, not in the air, back up into space. Gravity pulled it back down and eventually it did land. But it wasn't where it was supposed to be. It was a place that they called Abydos. And that's because it's, Abydos was the temple of Osiris, god of the dead, and it was a dark and horrible place. And it was under a cliff, which meant it didn't have a clear line of sight to the sky. It didn't have um, solar power, very much sunlight coming into the position it was, so it wasn't in a clear place. It wasn't where they planned, so they had no images of where it was. And in fact, when it landed, they didn't even know where it was. It was they just knew it landed because there was no GPS there. And the signals they were getting from it were from an omnidirectional antenna, so they could talk to it, but they didn't know where it was. They'd used loads of time on the landing. 
the orientation. They didn't know which way up the lander was. Um, and actually, two of the instruments didn't work either, so they knew they'd have failures. So they had to make really quick decisions, understanding that this is 30 minutes light travel away from the Earth, on what they were going to do next. Luckily, they had a really good operational concept. They thought of every step. So they prioritised the, uh, the instruments. They didn't do the drill because they thought the drill might tip the whole spacecraft up and damage it. So they didn't do that at all. They ran through most of the series and actually, in the, about, they had, I think they had about 56 hours left by the time they got the, uh, they got the first message and then about 24 hours of operations by the time they worked out what they were going to do. They did 90% of the science because they planned a good operational concept to meet the overall concept of operations, the mission goal. So that worked. Um, and by planning well, you'll never answer every question, and some things are good, the, the idea of, uh, of, of prioritising the instruments. Some things were less good. The reaction wheel turn off was then a problem later. You could make different decisions on that. But it led to a very successful mission. <coughs> what was even better was when it, when it finished and its battery died at the end of the three days of operations, they thought that was the end of the mission. And the orbiter continued on, and in June... So three months after the comet would have been in the surface too hot for the Philae lander to operate anymore, they got a message from Philae because it was in a sheltered area so it wasn't getting the full glare of sunlight. It was actually cooler than expected and it had charged the batteries and over a period of time it had automatically been doing science and doing other operations. So the orbiter got communications and it transferred more science and they thought, well, we thought we'd lost it anyway, let's do the drill. So they did the drill later on and they actually achieved all the mission goals in a different position with a change in mission. And I thought that was really successful and a good example of how a concept of operations was broken down with a load of questions into an operational concept, which let them then make rapid decisions on the mission and succeed every goal. That's my case study on the Philae lander. Has anybody got any questions on Philae? Come up. We'll have a little bit more time for questions if you think of anything in the meantime. Is this lecture going to be recorded? Yes, it's being recorded right now, I believe. Thanks. Yeah, the middle screen. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the benefits of CONOPS, and hopefully that's abundantly clear from the example that Ian has just uh, talk through. Now let's talk about the specificity around operational concepts. Okay, so we said that they're more detailed than a CONOPS and it really describes how the system is going to do something. Okay? It can help each of the individual kind of subsystem team members to understand how the components they're developing or the subsystems that they're developing are going to support and fit into that larger system. Okay, so really now, rather than just thinking of the system as a whole, you're breaking things down into what subsystems are doing, how they're going to do it, and when they're going to do it. Okay, so it's in a lot more detail. Um, you can think about it in the sense, if you're working with other people, about contractors and customers, making sure that everyone's aligned. So it can be really, really useful in terms of communicating how your system is actually going to achieve the goals that you've set out for it. Okay. The, operational, uh, sorry, the concept of operations at the start, that'll tell the customer that you've got the overall idea of the goal. Are you going to be able to satisfy their needs? The operational's concept will give them confidence that you know how you're going to do that. Okay. Do you understand the subtlety in what I've just said there? Okay. You're in your requirements development and then your, um, your kind of development of the system architecture, developing this operational concept or different operational concepts for different parts of the mission might help to find gaps. Okay. When you think about how something needs to do, it, uh, do what it's going to do, you might start to think about things that you didn't think about before. So asking all of these questions that Ian just mentioned. How are you going to get from the orbiting spacecraft down to the comet itself? Not just the fact that you need to get there, but exactly how you're going to do it will raise more questions 
that then inform things about the propulsion system, about the GNC system, about the communication system. Okay? So it can really help to identify things that you might not have thought about before. Again, it'll help your community really understand what's going on and then develop those even more detailed operations plans later. And if you need them, user guidance documents and things like that. And then, as well as just being supported by all of the other subsystems as well, you might need to develop subsystem models in order to inform your operational concept development. And I'll come on to an example of that in a moment. So there are loads and loads of different attributes that kind of feed into your definition of your operational concept. I'm not going to go through all of them here, but you might want to think about all of these different elements when you're developing those operational concepts. Okay? So again, what are the needs, goals, and objectives? These should be driving all of your decision making. Okay? If they're not traceable from that top level, why you're doing something, into what you're doing, and then how you're going to do it, then you need to question why you're doing that at all. Okay? What are the capabilities? How are the subsystems going to interface together? Okay? As the, some of you in the room will be the systems engineer, you'll be working with the operations engineer to really think about subsystem interfaces. Okay? How do things operate together to make sure that they can achieve those higher level goals? You should still consider the system life cycle. Okay? The operational concept might be relevant to a particular phase of the mission, breaking down that CONOPS, but it might also feed in later to decisions that affect other phases of the mission. Okay? So having a, a, an overall appreciation for all of those mission phases is going to be important for making certain decisions. Uh, of course, you're going to have to think about interactions with the physical environment. Okay? So your, your system is not operating just by itself in its own little world. You've got all of the other environments around it that are affecting things. And then some elements down at the bottom that you should think about as well. So maybe in cooperation with the sustainability and manufacturing engineer particularly, thinking about environmental and organizational elements. Thinking about who might need to do something in terms of operators and users. Your system might need intervention from humans. Okay? There's a bunch of constraints around actual people working on things rather than a machine doing something that you might need to think about. Identifying risks and potential issues is another key aspect of this. You can design in, when you start to think about your operational concepts, different types of redundancy, backup, margins, for example, that mean your mission might be more successful even under all types of uncertainty. Okay? And this would have been a large reason why the Phil A mission was as successful as it was. Okay? It, wasn't, uh, it was robust to a lot of the environmental conditions that it was placed in and wasn't just um, kind of vulnerable to them. Okay, we're going to go on to a slightly different example here and another example which highlights both the importance of an overall con ops, but then why an ops con is very important to making sure that your mission is successful overall. So, a little bit more recently, we had a launch of the Artemis 1 and this took a bunch of CubeSats on board as well as a primary payload, and some of them were deployed out along the way to this, uh, this launch vehicle going towards the moon. Okay, you'll see um, in the middle here, 13 CubeSats were supposed to be deployed during this mission at various different points, and you can see the points A, B, C, and D where these CubeSats were intended to be deployed. Okay? This is only one very, very small part of this mission, and they were essentially being given a free ride to the moon um, and doing various different experiments, so things like radiation, 
um, things like looking at um, uh, illuminating various different parts of the moon for future missions. Uh, so I would suggest you take a look at some of these CubeSats. They're very, very cool. But they weren't all successful, unfortunately. So I've broken, or I've taken another figure here where we're looking now at the CONOPS specifically for those CubeSats. So rather than the whole mission, we've now got a timeline across here of when the CubeSats were supposed to be deployed, where they are on the launch vehicle, where they're located radially inside the, um, the launch vehicle itself. Okay. Unfortunately, the whole mission was delayed. Okay. It got out to the launch pad, and then they had to delay it a couple of times for different reasons. But the CubeSats hadn't really, or most of the CubeSats themselves, hadn't accounted for that length of delay. Some of them were able to recharge. So they were able to, with an external interface to the deployer, recharge their batteries and make sure that then when they were launched, there was enough charge on the batteries to maybe deploy some solar panels, make sure that they could do some first communications, and then do all of their commissioning phase. Some of them hadn't designed this interface in. Okay? They thought everything's going to go perfectly, or maybe there'll only be a short delay, we'll make sure we've got enough charge in the battery, and we can wait until the launch, it'll be okay. So they didn't design that interface in to make sure that they could then recharge if there was a much longer delay. Some of them had active um, kind of biological experiments on board. So uh, one in particular had some yeast, and that yeast was originally cooled to make sure that it was uh, not very active, so that when it got into space, it would then multiply out, and then they would be able to do their science. That experiment, unfortunately, warmed up too much. They couldn't get access to it to refresh it, so to replace it. And so that experiment was essentially, it happened on the ground. It didn't happen in the space environment like they wanted it to. And they wanted to investigate how the deep space radiation would interact with how that yeast culture grew. Okay? It just happened on the launch pad instead. So unfortunately, because they hadn't thought about this kind of pre-launch phase where maybe there could be delays and how that might influence the design of maybe their power system or their payload, some of these CubeSats didn't actually even survive past launch. Or they couldn't meet their primary mission goals because their experiment had already expired. Okay? You can see how thinking about the operational concept of even the pre-launch mission phase can be really critical to your overall mission success. Okay? And that's not to say that these CubeSat teams didn't do a brilliant job. Just trying to get a CubeSat ready to launch is hard, and you're often on a much more constrained time scale and budget. But small, um, small things that are maybe not thought about early on in the mission concept in the early mission design can then really have an effect on your overall uh, mission success. Okay, slightly different example, uh, going away from uh, space-based systems to really highlight the difference between a concept of operations and an operational concept. Okay, so uh, Pilot.Auto is a open source um, toolbox or framework for looking at autonomous vehicles okay, and developing um, autonomous vehicle operations. And here they provided a overall CONOPS for a very small ground-based delivery robot. Okay, so you can see that they thought about this, not necessarily in a defined time sequence, but generally in terms of the different types of things it might need to interact with the key things that it might need to be able to do to achieve its overall aim, which is to deliver some groceries from a dispatch point or something like that. Okay? So you can see that it's got to interact with road crossings here, pedestrian traffic lights, it's going to do some on-demand delivery, 
It's got to avoid collisions, and maybe it's got to be able to be taken over remotely. Okay, these are all key elements of what the system is going to do. We can then look at an example of just one of these areas. Okay, and in this case, it's collision avoidance. Okay, and you can break that down into maybe three different areas, like they've done here. And now you can see exactly what it's going to do and how it's going to do it to an extent. It's going to, for dynamic objects, so objects are moving, on the sidewalk maybe, you have a person, how do you interact with that object? Well, you might stop, wait for it to pass, and then move on. If you find an obstacle in front of you, maybe there are two different ways which you can avoid that. Either you stop and wait for it to move. Okay, it could be that a car parked in front of you for a little while. It's unknown. You can wait for that to be moved. Or maybe you stop, you assess it, you avoid it, and then you can continue. Okay, so this is breaking down that overall conops, one element of it, so avoiding uh, obstructions, into how you're going to do it. And then you can drill even further into that with exact operational plans and flows of exactly how the subsystems might contribute to actually performing each of these different actions. Okay? So as you get more detailed, as you have more knowledge of all of your subsystems, you can then start to define exactly how each of these uh, operational concepts might be um, performed. I'm going to give another example, which is, again, a little bit closer to what I know. Uh, so the SOAR satellite, I like to use this example because I know a lot about it. Um, there were various different phases of this mission. So again, we had launch and early operations, but then we had experimental operations for this mission too, and we had two primary different experiments that we wanted to perform. We had these steerable fins at the back, and we were going to use those fins and how they interact with the atmosphere in very low Earth orbit to tell us things about aerodynamic interactions of different materials. Okay. Uh, the first one here tells us about how the drag generated by these materials changed the trajectory of the satellite. And then the second one, which it will be shown in just a second, looks at the torques generated by those fins when they're used in different configurations and how the attitude of the satellite changed in response to those. Okay? Both of those experiments ultimately told us things about the interactions of gas particles with materials at a very kind of microscopic level. Okay. This video is a very high level concepts of operations for those experiments. Uh, if we look back onto the launch and early operations phase, we can think about maybe all of the different tasks in a little bit more of an operational concept uh, kind of framework in terms of what things have to happen when. Okay? So this could be represented like a table like this. It's just a set of tasks. You could have it as a flowchart maybe with um, different things that feed into each other, and if one thing doesn't work, then maybe you do something differently. Okay? You can think about um, maybe phase transitions or mode transitions. So in this case, um, again, there were various different things that we had to do before launch, but we started here from the deployment from the International Space Station. The first thing that we had to do and this was actually automated because we didn't have any communications at this point, was release the antenna. Okay? If we hadn't thought about it and needed to command the satellite to release the antenna, then we may never have got communications. If you don't deploy your antenna so that you can actually get communications from the ground to do things later, then yeah, that mission also could have been a failure. Make initial contact. So 
That antenna is now deployed. We can use our communication system and then command the release of the steerable fins, so these folding panels that you saw in the video. Now that, again, was a very, very critical part of this early operations phase because those fins actually covered the majority of the solar panels on the side of the satellite. So if those fins hadn't deployed soon enough, and we prioritize this for a reason, then again, similarly to the lunar CubeSats, the battery might have drained simply just doing small communications exercises, maybe trying to figure out its position, maybe trying to deploy the fins themselves using the uh, thermal knife to um, uh, break the, um, the release cord, and the battery might have drained substantially enough that it wouldn't have been able to deploy them. Okay. We did have a backup, and that's that the um, cord that was placed around the steerable fins was made of a material that we expected would eventually be eroded by the atomic oxygen in the environment. But that might have taken quite a long time. Okay. But eventually, it would have deployed, and then the solar panels would have been able to raise the charge in the battery, and we would have been able to carry on with the mission, albeit much later on. Okay? We would have shrunk our mission time considerably. And then after the steerable fins were uh, deployed, we were able to detumble the satellite, so actually activate the attitude control system. If we'd done that before, it might have used up too much power. Okay? Trying to use magnet talkers, trying to use reaction control wheels, trying to use sensors that might have been covered by the fins. Okay, the sensors, some of the fine sun sensors, were covered up by the steerable fins. They wouldn't have been any use. Uh, enable the battery heater. Again, if that had been enabled too soon, then it might have drained the power in the battery itself, and then we might not have had enough power to do anything. Uh, enabling watchdogs, performing clock sync, etc., etc., and then we can start doing the other component checkout and calibration and then commissioning activities after this. Now moving on into a little bit more detail, we can think about the different components and the different subsystems on the satellite and how they need to be used for different modes and the different mission phases. So on the top here, I've defined the different modes that the satellite needed to do through its whole overall lifetime. Okay? So this is driven by the concept of operations. Okay, we need a nominal mode somewhere or some mode that the satellite's going to be in generally when it's not doing anything else. Okay? Just persisting, doing its normal, normal operations. We might have a downlink mode, okay, so when it's directly going to be in communication with one of our ground stations, and then various different experimental modes when it's doing the actual goals of the mission. Okay, so lift and drag experiments that I mentioned. There were some other uh, secondary experiments that we wanted to perform, so measuring thermospheric wind vectors, performing atmospheric characterization. And then we can break down, okay, when are these systems going to be used? When are all of the different components in the satellite, and at this stage, yeah, these are labeled as components. You've got um, the onboard computer, you've got the ADCS system, you've got the heaters for the battery. Um, but at a very early stage in your design, you could consider this just at a subsystem level. When do I need to use my ADCS? When do I need to use my comm system? When do I need to use my payload? And you can think about when they need to be used in different combinations. When is, good, when is going to be the most constrained time for your comm system or for your power system? Okay? That might drive the design of that system, and it might not be in your main mission mode. It might be at some other time during your mission. Okay? That's why thinking about your overall concept of operations is really important, because you might miss a critical part of the mission if you just think about the mission, uh, the, um, the kind of main operations phase. Okay. 
And I mentioned before about needing to support some of this activity with systems modeling. Okay, so in this case where we've got ons and offs, that tells us something, okay? You might be able to think about uh, general power draw from each of these systems. You might be able to think about, okay, data might be move, moving between them. But we can actually model that, and we can model it over time. So in this case, we've got a modeled power draw by those different systems, and we know which systems need to be used for different operations. Yes? Depth of discharge. Okay? So it means basically how much the battery is drained. So 100% is the battery has drained all of its usable power, right? Um, yes. But that is. Yeah. Okay? Actually, depth of discharge in this case is the other way around. So 100% charged to 0%. Okay? So it starts off at 100% at the top. So it should be very charged, just like how we see in our computers and our phones yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, you can look at it that way. Okay? Um, so in this case, we're looking at the amount of power that can be generated. That's going in a orbital cycle. So you go into eclipse, you can't generate power. You come out of eclipse, you can use the solar arrays to generate power. And then you have your different operations, and maybe you've got a sequence in which you want to be able to perform these. So then you can model that over time, and you can look at the balance between your power consumption and your power uh, generation, and how that battery charge changes over time. Okay, so your operational concept can be backed up and can be validated by systems modeling efforts like this. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, this is something that you'll come on to much, much later in the semester, but understanding how that con ops flows into your ops con and then is supported by systems modeling is really important. Okay. Okay. We're going to break out into a bit of a workshop where we want you guys to try and develop for a task that I'm going to talk through in just a second. First of all, a conops. So thinking about the overall mission and what it needs to do. Ideally, try and develop some type of sketch for that or some type of diagram. Um, some of you might have paper, pen and paper. Some of you can use just paint or some other graphic software on a laptop to try and build up a graphical representation of this conops. Okay? And then after we've done that, we'll start to think about the actual operational concepts for various different parts of this mission. We'll start to think about the different modes that your vehicle or system might need. We'll start to think about the different phases of that mission. And then after that, we'll start to think about how they might drive some of the subsystem design and drive the systems modeling that you might need to do to validate that. Okay? So we're going to take it away a little bit from just space, because this is aerospace systems. And we're going to think about transporting a small package from a dispatch center to a residential customer using a UAV. Okay, so um, a good example of that would have been what Amazon was supposed to try and do and apparently have canceled. Delivery of small packages to customers using multi-rotors. Okay, so the first goal, and we'll spend maybe 15 to 20 minutes on this, is to start sketching that CONOPS diagram. And I've suggested here a mission timeline kind of diagram. So uh, going back to the Rosetta example or the Artemis example, and feel free to look up other examples of CONOPS missions or CONOPS diagrams online, but specifically for this 
uh, mission and try and define those kind of key um, different phases of that mission, okay? So think about the key actions that this system or vehicle needs to perform to achieve this overall goal, okay? And Ian, Kieran, myself will come around and start to talk to you guys. Uh, work in, I'd suggest maybe groups of four, maybe five. If you want to form into your groups that you're working with generally, uh, in the unit, you can do that as well, but it's probably not that easy in this room. Okay, uh, are there any other questions at the moment on this? I have seen a few diagrams around the room. I know that some of the review have been putting timelines together, starting to think about those kind of key mission phases. Uh, does anyone want to contribute a, an idea of maybe some of those key stages or key tasks that this type of system might need to perform to achieve this mission. I'll come, I'll come to you in a second if we haven't got another volunteer. Okay, you guys start here. Me? No, up here. Okay, if it's like fully autonomous, maybe some sort of like barcode scanning system Okay, so maybe something about identifying parcels is going to be important for achieving this type of mission. Cool. Up here. Um, I mean, for the first one, we just had like a tax the package to sort of use the test for stability to drive like you know, a couple of tests just to make sure it's all working. Uh huh. Okay, so. Yeah, that might not necessarily be just the first step, but that might be a step in pre-takeoff, okay? So, or as you're taking off, just making sure that everything is working. Okay, anyone else? Yep. Okay, yeah, so working out your navigation beforehand so that you know where you're gonna go. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so it sounds like you've almost set some requirements there. Um, maybe if you think about just the terminology and how you phrase that, but then trying to turn that into a concept of operations, maybe thinking about the exact things that it needs to do, so whether it's maybe takeoff is gonna be a key, uh, key phase of that mission, then your transit from maybe location A to location B landing okay so your most basic kind of mission based con ops might be take off move land but then you can go beyond that so we can think about what it's got to do before it needs to take off maybe what it's got to do whilst it's actually transiting from a to b it's not going to exist in completely free airspace with no other things to think about, okay? There might be aspects such as the environmental conditions to consider, maybe other things that are in the air, other vehicles, birds, might need to avoid them, identify them. And what does it do when it lands or when it gets ready to land? How does it know where it's gonna be? How does it know where it's supposed to land, how to do that safely? Okay, so the first instance, and I've taken a bit of a diagram here, is to just think about those kind of key elements to that mission that you might need to think about before then you might start to break those down into more detail. Okay, so in terms of just a diagram that describes the overall mission or the middle part of the mission because we're not really considering what it's doing in the distribution center, Okay, so maybe identifying what parcel it's got to pick up, doing a little bit of a test to make sure that it's stable. But once it's ready to take off, ensuring that it can clearly take off, okay, there's nothing above it that's going to cause an obstruction. Making sure that it can actually fly from A to B safely, 
avoiding things along the way, identifying where it's going to descend and doing that safely, again, checking things are clear, and then delivering something to the customer, okay? Maybe then thinking about how is it safe around people on the ground so that it doesn't pose a risk, and then how to know when those people have retreated safely enough so that it can take off again, okay? Maybe these are some of the challenges that meant that Amazon wasn't willing to take on this challenge at the moment, okay? Why they haven't implemented something like this. Okay. I also mentioned uh, mission phases and kind of system modes that might be associated with the various parts of the mission, okay? This is just some of the ideas that I noted down. This is not an exhaustive list of how this UAV might need to operate. So uh, you might have a startup phase where you need to do safety checks, check if you've got GPS, you need to know where you are before you need to figure out where you're going to go to and how you're going to get there. You might need to upload a pre-planned trajectory or maybe the drone itself or the UAV is going to do that. You might need some initiation, characterization, calibration. Take off, another key phase. You've got your navigation, you've got your landing, and then maybe you've got a phase of the mission where you disarm, power off, etc. And each of these phases we can maybe associate with one or more modes. Okay? So you might have a powered off mode, okay? Everything's turned off, no problem. You might need a programming mode, so it might not be captured in the phases I've listed, but maybe there's a maintenance phase, or maybe there's a kind of setup phase where you need to interface with the vehicle when it's powered on, but in a safe manner, okay? And then be able to maybe change software, update it, maybe do some maintenance on it as well. You could have an initialization mode, so checking things are working, but not necessarily in flight ready mode. If any of you have operated kind of small drones, you tend to have these modes. Okay, so that they're, they're safe around you before you're ready to actually go and take off. A flight mode, but you might have multiple different flight modes. Again, uh, consumer off-the-shelf things might have a, a standard flight mode, but then they might have a sports mode, okay? Racing drone mode. Uh, maybe attitude stabilized mode, so that you can take really nice pictures with a drone. Um, someone, I think up here, mentioned image recognition before. You might also want to do that on board whilst in flight. So maybe you're trying to figure out where you've got to go and where you can land, how you can do that safely. Uh, maybe you want to also use that as part of your navigation. Okay, can you recognize features that can help you? And then maybe you want a recovery mode as well. What happens when something goes wrong? And you might want multiple versions of a recovery mode. You might have what happens if one motor fails. And then you might want to have what happens if everything's gone really badly and you just need to ditch it safely. Okay, we had an idea like that up there. Okay, so I've mentioned these kind of elements. Now the last thing that I'd like you to do is now think about how these, this first of all, the CONOPS, so that overall kind of system definition, description, diagram, and then the phases and the modes might drive some of the system requirements that you're going to develop, okay? Um, if you want to think about that in the scope of your satellite, you can do, or we can carry on with the example here, and I'll run through a few different ideas just at the end. And then also think about what type of modeling you might need to do to kind of validate some of those uh, operational concepts and the system requirements associated with them. Okay, we'll work on that maybe another 10 minutes, and then we'll just do a quick wrap up and then we'll be finished. Okay.
Let's do a quick wrap up because I know it's getting close to five o'clock and uh, give you a couple of minutes in case there are any kind of final questions and then you guys can get out of here and have a weekend. Um, so we've talked through the con ops, we've talked through phases and modes and I've just identified here some elements that from your con ops and from those phases and modes that you might want to have thought about in terms of what requirements they drive and then also what systems modeling you might want to perform to support that con ops and then those more detailed uh, operational concepts. So things like altitude and payload range. So in the diagram, we didn't define anything about how far it needs to go. Okay? That should be driven by the user need generates into a user requirement. You then have a high-level system requirement which might describe carrying a certain payload to a certain distance or some combination of payload and distance. Okay? First of all, you'll have a functional requirement, then you'll have a performance requirement associated with that. But you would want to think about that in the sense of if you've got to avoid things and you've got to take off and you've got to land safely and you've got to return, or maybe you want to deliver multiple packages in a single flight about how that might affect your altitude that you're going to fly at, what type of vehicles you might need to avoid in a regulatory sense, but also how far you can go in terms of your payload range. Uh, we talked at various points about collision, detection, and avoidance. So how are you actually going to perform that collision detection? Does that maybe drive you rather than just having one payload, which would be the package that needs to be delivered, but having additional sensors on board to be able to do recognition of the package, recognition of the ground target, recognition of things that you have to avoid in the air as well? That could be the same system. Maybe it's gimbaled and can look around, or maybe it's a completely separate system. Maybe you have to have a radar on board not just rely on visual methods, okay? Maybe operating in day compared to nighttime adds different requirements, okay? And then might actually change your con ops substantially. Uh, position knowledge and accuracy, okay, so thinking about how you know where you are and how well you know where you are, okay? If you need to land in a certain space and it's residential, maybe understanding exactly how big that area is will help you define, okay, is GPS enough? Or do you need another way of determining position when you're at that scale a little bit more accurately? Uh, I mentioned image recognition tracking. Comms capability, is everything gonna be autonomous? Do you need to be in contact with your vehicle at all times? Does it need to be in contact with the person it's delivering to? Uh, or can it just do everything itself? And how that might change depending on maybe where it's going, okay? Do you need line of sight or is it gonna be using cell reception or maybe satcoms? And then human awareness and safety as well, okay? So in that CONOPS diagram, if you developed it a little bit more, you could think about who it's actually interacting with. Maybe at the start of the mission, there's someone who ha actually has to load it up so you're thinking about how it's interacting with both the built environment